Well, Jonathan, uh, watching the Euro 2028 bid launch yesterday and then the strategy launch, I was reminded of that line about decades where nothing happens and then weeks where decades happen. It's a day that we could look back on in time to come as a seismic day for the FAI. There's been a mixed response to both, I think. Looking at the Euro 2028 launch, considering the FAI at the moment is in a debt of over 50 million, why do you think it's the right time to go chasing a big event such as Euro 2028? Well, look, first of all, I think you're right. I think yesterday may well have been a seminal day in relation to um, uh, the, the FAI. But um, for me, uh, very much because of this document and the, um, uh, the, our strategy for the next four years. Now, also, Euro 2028 lies outside of that four year period. Um, but it was important yesterday um, because of the timetable and the timescale that UEFA have given us, um, which is um, an expression of interest by March the 23rd, that we did get out and tell both UEFA that the five FAs as a group were committed to bidding for Euro 2028, but also at the same time, of course, um, to confirm on the back of the feasibility study that we would not be bidding for World Cup 2030. So that to a degree was a timing thing. Um, look, of course, I've seen um, the reaction and, and, and the understandable reaction of, of those fans um, uh, who support the League of Ireland clubs to say, why would we, why would be, we be investing now um, into a into a Euro bid? We should be concentrating um, on Irish football. Well, that's exactly what this strategy does. It does um, absolutely concentrate on the future of Irish football. Um, but I said yesterday, and I say again today, the two areas need not be mutually exclusive. We have a commitment in this document um, to support facilities around League of Ireland, by the way, not just League of Ireland, but also for our grassroots. But we also make a commitment in here to look at hosting and bidding for major international events, of which Euro 28 um, will be one. And my broad feeling in relation to Euro 28 is that having done all of the work that we've done in relation to not just the World Cup bid and the, fe the feasibility study, but all of the work that we did, by the way, to successfully bid to host games in Euro 2020, that we're in a very good position now um, to know what it is that we have to do moving forward and what we have to do in terms of finalising the bid documentation for, for UEFA. And we had a very small team of three guys um, who were looking at the feasibility study. They were all part of the Euro 2020 bid and therefore for ourselves, the cost of bidding is not going to be significant at all. And I think as part of a wider overall strategy, hosting the event and being part of the hosting of the, the third largest sporting event in the world is a good and positive thing and it'll be a great and positive thing um, for Irish football, particularly if we qualify for the event as well, if we get to a point whereby we are part of the hosting of it. A lot of the concern is that one does lead to the other though, that a lot of what you're talking about and the 61 different KPIs and that require financial support and that any money that firstly goes towards the bid will have a knock-on effect towards some of the initiatives that are in place in the strategy document, and also at a government level, that bids are something that excites governments because they're in the distance and they can uh, throw the green flag around it and all of that, that actually the bid may end up overshadowing a lot of the very you know, grassroots level initiatives that are in that document. How do you assure people that, that that's not going to be the case? Okay, well, a number of things there. First of all, it's up to the government if they want to be part of the bidding process for large events. And I think they've been pretty consistent in saying that is something that they want to do. And yesterday, Minister Chambers did say that they support um, uh, the, the, the process of bidding for Euro 28, but obviously need to look at um, uh, detail around it um, as part of the process. What's really important to, to, to state is that the FAI on an annual basis is still making money. And thankfully, we are now back into a situation whereby we are selling tickets um, for our international games across 2022. And we have six games that are planned for this year. Um, the first game of that in, uh, will be our centenary game against Belgium, where we hope to have a sold out um, Aviva Stadium for it. There is still a massive debt there, though, as well. There is still a massive debt there. And we have a plan, as you know, and Roy may speak to that in relation to how we've um, how we've structured and restructured that debt over a long period where we have budgeted on an annual basis to be able to pay down that debt across that longer period. As part of that same budgetary process, we talk about what do we want to do with the monies that we do have available for us. So how much has been budgeted for this bid? Uh, it's, it, 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 as I say, it, there's three people who are working on it. So it's a very it's a very modest amount in relation to what we, the FAI, have to put behind the bid process itself. 
and it is shared within the other uh, the other four associations as well. But my point is, is that we also are making very specific um, um, commitments to all of the areas that we talk about in relation to the strategy. And so later today, we're making an announcement that over and above the two million euros that the government have given us in relation to the grassroots, we are making an additional um, contribution to the grassroots, which is what we should be doing as a football association. That is our purpose. So again, I say it's, it doesn't necessarily follow that by doing one thing means that we can't do the others. And we are planning very, very carefully. And this process and this strategy will give us the framework to be able to, um, to plan very carefully how we allocate the money that we do have available for us. And we are a non-for-profit organization and we put that money back into the game. I've just hired a new COO who's coming from the English FA, um, David Carell, who will come in and manage that process really carefully to make sure that all the decisions we make in terms of that budgetary process are connected to our strategic objectives. We have set ourselves priorities here and we now have a roadmap against which we can work to achieve those priorities. Um, and it will, be, it will be tough, it will be hard, it's a tough, uh, wider economic situation, um, but this gives us the ambition and the direction and the plan to do that. Roy, there's always a debate around bids for major tournaments in terms of the cost involved, what the actual benefits are, and there's unquestionably a tourism benefit. If Ireland were to get Euro 2028 and get matches, what's the benefit to football? The, be well, sorry, the, the, the benefit uh, for football as, as a whole is, is we'll have the third largest sporting event uh, in, our, in our country played, played, played in our stadium uh, in front of uh, you know many people young and older in Ireland who will want to go to those matches uh, and uh, unlike every tournament in the past whether Ireland's been involved in them or not they always have an impact and they always have an impact on, on people uh, who, 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 were, who were there or, or spectating or watching uh, and particularly younger people. So, so, I, so what will the impact be? I think um, we, we, to the extent that we win the bid, I think it will show that Ireland are well capable of co-hosting um, major events, uh, which would be good uh, for the future, uh, and it will bring an awful lot of uh, people uh, into the country um, and see see what Ireland's about and what Irish football is about, and hopefully Stephen and the team will be playing. Uh, in front of sold out crowds in Dublin and, and wherever. And that, and, that, and that to me would be the key, is that um, if if we can have um, the Irish team part of the tournament itself, I don't think there's any question that the um, uh, the, the, the young boys and girls in, in Ireland, um, uh, along with many other adults who will, be, um, who, who will enjoy the mm. tournament, will not be inspired to take up the sport of football. That is what we're here to do. And I think that inspiration, you've seen it in previous tournaments when Irish teams have been part of it. The effect on the nation and the galvanising effect on the nation is something only football can do. Yeah? The Irish national football team um, uh, has an effect on the, uh, on the nation in a way that no other sport in Ireland does. And that would be one really strong reason for me um, for us to be part of that actual process. Now, look, one of the things that UEFA are looking at is moving from 24 teams to potentially 32 teams mm. taking part in that tournament. Now, if it does go to 32 teams, it would be very much part of our objective, and this may again be written into the, uh, the 26 to 30 um, strategic plan, for us to qualify directly to the tournament, whether we're hosting it or not. And I think that the effect on Irish football of having the men's senior team, and by the way, having the women's senior team qualify for a Euro of a World Cup, is absolutely transformative um, for the game. And that's that would be my simple answer to your question. It will inspire um, everyone to become involved in our sport. That's what we're here to do. To implement the strategy document over the next three, four years, obviously money is uh, a key part of that, but also getting buy-in is something that's acknowledged. And the football fraternity, as you know, in this country is uh, quite disparate and it can be difficult at times to bring them together. And we've seen in the last few weeks, even some of the issues with League of Ireland clubs and schoolboy clubs. How do you go about bringing them together, particularly if you look at the article in the Daily Mail, which was raising questions about the fact you're not living in Ireland at the moment, that maybe some board members have concerns. Have you been able, while not living in the country, been able to grasp all the various different factions that are there within Irish football? Oh, look, I've been, I've, I've been working um, uh, 12 hour days every day since I started 15 months ago in relation to uh, building my understanding of Irish football and uh, talking to, as you say, all of the many disparate uh, 
and different stakeholders across the game. So I think I've built up a pretty good understanding of, um, of, of some of the core issues. And by what, by the way, some of, the, uh, some of them are not rocket science. And to answer your question, one of the things we do need to do is to get people who may have what look like diametrically opposed um, views on a specific subject into one room so we can talk through the issues to see if we can come up with a solution. And unless we do that, we won't come up with solutions. But that needs everyone to come into the room and to come into the room um, in the right frame of mind and um, with the belief that we can find solutions to some of these historical legacy issues that we've got. Are you going to move to Ireland? Uh, look, I am. I, 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 all of this has been complicated by the pandemic. Mm, and you're very clearly. much aware of what's happened in terms of first six months that I was in the job, nobody could move from one place to another. We were all in lockdown anyway. Um, I am now working um, uh, five days a week here um, in, in Abbottstown. I'm actually working in an office where there are no other staff in here because the office hasn't been open. But I understand symbolically how important mm. it is for me to be here. Has it been a concern for the board, Roy? Um, no, it hasn't been a concern. Um, so, and, and, you know, at, at, at a level, um, it's a little bit strange having this conversation about, you know, somebody not coming to the office and working in the office where for the last couple of years, nobody's been able, able, able to do that. And, and as we've evolved through a pandemic, people's attitude to work in the workplace and what's, what's appropriate and what's going to be normal in the future has completely changed. From my perspective, as, as I look at it, and I probably work uh, the, the closest uh, uh, with, with Jonathan, you know, on board in, in my role, um, you know, I have a very simple view. I mean, um, you kind of judge people on outcomes. You judge them on their effectiveness, their productiveness, uh, and their work ethic, and, and, and how they go about it. So Jonathan, in my view, and in the board's view, is doing a really excellent job, um, uh, both in terms of what he's achieving, how he's achieving it, uh, and the hours, um, productive hours that he's put, putting in. So I prefer to have a really good chief executive who works in the office three or four days a week than having a not so good chief executive who works seven days a week in, in the office. Uh, so for me, it really is a non-issue. What, what's more important is... It probably will days. continue to be an issue though until there's an answer. So is your, your intention is to work five days in Dublin, but to be based out of, out of England? At the moment, my family is staying in, yeah. in, 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 in London for a variety of family-related issues. I have young um, kids who are a specific part of their education whereby it would be unfair to move them at this particular point. But um, I think Roy's point um, uh, is, is well made in relation to, uh, for me, it doesn't really matter which room I'm sitting in. Um, if you think about the hundreds of Zoom and Teams calls that I've had um, with all of those people connected to the Irish football community and beyond, that's what it's important. Well, just in terms of outcomes then, just because there are hundreds, I'm sure, of meetings and lots of decisions that are being made, but we're always going to look at the senior team as been the focal point and two big decisions and two key negotiations around, firstly, the sponsor for the men's senior team, 18 months in, still no new sponsor, and also Stephen Kenny's new contract, which by all accounts, he wants to stay. You want him to stay. It's, I think, two months, if not more, since you were tasked with getting that contract agreed. On both of those, what's the what's the issue and what's the delay? Well, with Stephen, as you say, it's 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 pretty simple actually, because uh, as you said, Stephen wants to continue in the role, and we're delighted at that because we want him to continue in the role. Um, he has an existing contract which is in place until the end of July, and we are in the process of negotiating um, a, a, a renewal of that contract through to um, uh, through to the end of Euro um, twenty twenty four. Um, so, um, Do you expect it to be done by the Belgium game, the next international break? Absolutely, yeah. And in terms of the sponsor, because maybe this again goes back to the longer term future, getting investment back into the FAI. What, what's the key block, do you think, for is it the reputation because there's talk of a rebrand of the FAI? Is, is it what's gone on for the last decade in the FAI that's stopping major companies coming forward? Oh, look, the performances on the pitch. I think clearly there's an element in relation to, to the brand and legacy issues, but I do genuinely believe that we're moving away from those legacy issues now. And I think issues um, connected to a pandemic, connected, uh, connected to Brexit, means that at the level of investment that we're looking at, um, brands and businesses that are, in op uh, are operational in Ireland in particular are looking closely at, all, at their cost base in the same way that we're looking carefully at our cost base. But I do genuinely believe that we have um, something 
in the senior men's team and what's happening with Stephen and with the young players who are coming through that I think are absolutely reflective of a new island that a brand and a business will want to be associated with. We've already had success with that in relation to one brilliant business and brand in Sky committing to the women's national team. And we will find a brand and business to commit to the men's national team. We have to be in the right place at the right time. That's just a sales process. But I, th I think I think your point is 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 a, is a good one. You know, it, it, the, you know the brand and the lack of trust in the brand. You know, were they impediments to to many things, including um, you know a national team sponsor? And the, the the easy and obvious answer to that is absolutely yes. Uh, but what we've been about for the last couple of years, but we're in the executive the board, is is to put in place, um, you know, a set of things uh, which can uh, improve the organisation, improve the people in the organisation and their effectiveness, and build up trust and make. The organisation investable, you know, for, for for third parties, from a, you know, commercial sponsors or whomever, and there's no easy or quick fix to that. There's a whole combination of different things that we've done, but I think we've got there now. And most most of the anecdotal uh, the evidence and feedback that we're getting from all of our stakeholders is that yes, this this is an organisation that uh, they they believe in and believe we're on the right track. So ergo, commercial sponsors and others, we believe. Uh, we think exactly the same. Thanks for your time, lads.